Yeah. <clears throat> okay, we're rolling. This is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York, the 15th of March, or excuse me, 15th of April, 2005, approximately 10.30 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Cahos, New York was my place of birth. That's just a small city nine miles north of Albany. I'm sure you all know. But anyhow, right at the confluence of the Mohawk and Hudson Rivers, we've got the beautiful Cahos Falls, like, A, hey, you wouldn't believe. Right now in the spring with all the rain and the snow melt, they're in their glory, so come on over. If you can't afford to go to Niagara, come to Cahos. Okay. The falls are there waiting for you. Well, anyhow, that's where I was born on May 23rd, 1924. What was your education prior to entering military service? Well, well, I, I did get a bilingual education with the, uh, the sisters, the French, the French Canadian sisters, they served to St. Anne, so, so that was a half a day French and a half a day in English mm -hmm. at the parochial school of Saint Joseph in Cahos. And then after that, uh, well, then I, for high school, I, I went to the, the Catholic high school in, in Cohoes, which was Keefe Memorial Academy. And that was the Irish parish of St. Bernard's. St. Joseph was the French parish. Well, I got to meet some nice Irish girls, you know. And so anyhow, I graduated from there. And um, well, anyhow, in my senior year, That's when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and I, I'll never forget that day. I was home with my father. He had the radio on, the old Atwater Kent radio, and FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the only president I ever knew growing up, interrupted the program to tell us that we had been bombed in Pearl Harbor. It was a day I'll never forget. And, and, and this triggered, you know, like patriotism, like we've never seen it since then. So many boys in high school just quit, joined the services. My husband was in, you know, he, he lived in Troy and he, he quit school, went the Marine Corps. Did went, you know him at that time? No, no, no. I just knew people in Cahoes. Mm -hmm. Never went anywhere. Did you, you know, know where Pearl Harbor was? I oh yeah. Well, I was good in geography. Mm -hmm. You know, I was very good in geography, and I loved maps. Oh, I, I used to read maps. You know, I had the encyclopedia there, and I was I always had my nose in there. That was yeah, and. So I knew where Pearl Harbor was, and so anyhow, boys in our class, they, you know, they quit school, joined the Merchant Marine. By the time graduation came in June, you know, a couple of them were already dead with the German U-boats doing a, doing a real number on us in the North Pacific, or I mean the North Atlantic. Oh yeah my husband that was out in the Pacific when he was just a kid. He went in at 17, you know. Mm -hmm. Made an X where his parents' signature should have been. You know, they were, just came over from Italy and so he was just first generation of tech. Of course, I didn't know him then. I didn't know him. So anyhow, then when I heard that women could go into the military service. Oh my God, I couldn't wait to go in. But then I found out you had to be 21 to join for women or 20 if your parents signed for you, signed a release. So I couldn't wait. I had always wanted to be a teacher and thought I'd go to what they used to call the normal school, which was New York State Teachers College in Albany. I thought I would go there, <clears throat> but I didn't want to be in college for four years with a war going on. Couldn't wait till I was 20 and could go. 
So my mother said, well, you took a college entrance course, so what are you going to do? So he, she insisted I go to Mildred Ellie Secretarial School. So I did. So I would take the bus every day from Cohoes and go to Albany. And so I went to Mildred Ellie, got my typing speed up, got my uh, shorthand. Greg's shorthand, you know, yeah, it came in handy. Well, anyhow, so I then I got a job at Bear Manning. Now, Bear Manning was a sandpaper place. They made all kind of grades of sandpaper and water valise. But during the war, you know, every factory had to be involved in the war effort, and so they had what they called an aviation division. So I went and applied for a job there. I got, I got a job and, uh, in the aviation division in the office, and so I was uh, working in the aviation division on, it was the, uh, it was called a harness. It was a kind of a horseshoe with all the wiring that went around the Corsair fighter plane. Mm -hmm. That was a fighter plane for the Navy. So that's what we did there in the aviation division of Bear Manning. Now, did you do soldering and splicing? No, I was in the office. Okay. <laughs> I was in the office. Well, that was I, important, I mean, I, too. I had my, uh, I had my uh, you know, office training, mm -hmm. Mildred Alley Secretarial School. So I was in the office, yes. I was in the office there, and it was a very nice place to work. Well, anyhow, of course, when I graduated from high school, I was 18. When I finished Mildred Ellie, I was 19. So after one year at Bear Manning, I was 20. Hooray! 20, old enough to go in the service. So anyhow, um, I met recruiting, the recruiting posters, oh yeah, for the Navy. And I always looked good in navy blue, you know. And, uh, but then I was down at Muggery Wards and Menands in the big store shopping, and there was a girl from the Coast Guard on recruiting there. Tell you the truth, I had, you know, didn't know too much about the Coast Guard. But I'll tell you, she was so nice. Right then and there, I decided that would be the service I would go into. So I went home and I asked my mother if she would be willing to sign for me because I was just 20 and she said yes. She knew how bad I wanted to go in. So, so I got sworn in now, down, in, down in Albany. Now were they upset at Bear Manning that you were leaving to go into the Coast Guard? Well, I, I, they, they weren't upset. No, uh -huh. no. I mean, they didn't give me a party or anything. <laughs> and I wasn't there quite a year. It was like maybe a month before the year was up. Yeah. If I had stayed out an extra month, they would have given me a going away present of like uh, I think they gave a hundred dollars oh. to anybody who had worked there a year and was going into the service. Uh -huh. So they were very patriotic there. It was really a very nice place to work. But I didn't know about that, but so but I was anxious to go in the service. So uh -huh. I forfeited that hundred dollar parting gift. <laughs> from when did you enter when did you enter the Coast Guard? So Do you remember? So let's see. So the date uh, I went down to Albany right on well, what used to be the post office there across the street. That's what that's Broadway in mm -hmm. Albany. It was right on the corner of that beautiful building there, right on, on the corner of a Broadway and mm -hmm. State Street right. there. Mm -hmm. And on the second floor, I'll never forget, that I went up there and I swore myself into the Coast Guard. I took the oath to... And before I left the house, my sister Frances, who was nine years older than me, she took out the camera and she took a picture of me with my long hair, because I always wore long hair, you know. And um, so I got sworn in, and I took the bus back home. And when I got home, she was waiting for me with a pair of scissors. And she gave me my <laughs> short haircut. <laughs> and then she took my picture again with the short haircut. It was the first time that I had my long curls cut off, you know, I had long hair all the time. <laughs> 
Well, anyhow. So, do you, do you, excuse me, do you remember what month and year that was? Oh, yeah, that was uh, September, September uh, 14. Okay, September 14, 1944. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I got graduated from high school in 42. So this was 44, yes. And, you know, so I was in service for two years, so I got out in 46. And, well, anyhow, so then I had to wait for my orders to start out. They came, and I was thrilled to pieces. My mother and my girlfriend, Helen, took the bus with me, the Bow Brother bus, took it down to Albany, to the railroad station in Albany, that beautiful Union Station, which is a bank today. And they saw me off on the train, and off I went and got off at Grand Central Station. And from there, I worked my way on down to, to Broad Street and met the rest of the gang of the girls that would be the girls that I started into the service with in boot camp. And so then, after they fed us supper, we went to Pennsylvania Station, boarded a train, and choo-chooed on down to West Palm Beach, got off the train. It took 25 hours then. I still remember. It was 25 hours from Pennsylvania Station, New York, to Palm Beach Station, and we got off. This was my first trip to Florida. And so then we got in a bus and over the over Lake Worth to get into Palm Beach. Hey, Palm Beach! Woo! It was beautiful. Of course, the Breakers is there, but we weren't stationed at the Breakers. We had the Biltmore. It was an, another hotel that had been taken over for the Spar training station. And, and so we, six weeks of boot camp. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, I loved it. Hey, I, I learned to climb the cargo net and do all that other stuff crawl around on your belly. It was regular boot camp. Oh yeah. And and then we would go to the ocean for swimming, you know, in those woolly woolly GI bathing suits. Navy blue of course. And uh anyhow, I it was my first taste of the Atlantic Ocean and I tasted the salt in it and it did taste good. And uh well anyhow we were only there two weeks, but there was a, 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 a hurricane warning. A hurricane? Huh? Well, so we had to batten down the hatches and oh, I said, nothing's going to happen. Oh my God, we had to secure the place like you wouldn't believe. Well, anyhow, that was my first taste of a hurricane. In the morning, I'll tell you, every palm tree around had lost its top. They were just sticks left. It was really a hurricane. So those were things that I had never seen in Cohoes. Hurricane, Atlantic Ocean, yeah, so. And uh, it, it, was, it was great. I was on uh, KP duty the whole bit, yeah. Now, did you have to pull guard duty at all? No guard, no. But we had, you know, we had to learn to march and do all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I always thought I was tall. In Cohoes, I always thought I was a tall girl. But down there, I, I was the last one in the back because they were all taller than me, you know? Mm -hmm. And for dress parade, every Saturday morning was dress parade. And, oh, I love that. But I was, I was always bringing up the rear. Oh dear. So anyhow, they give you all the aptitude tests and uh, decided I would be a good storekeeper. So I started storekeeper school. So after the six weeks of boot training, it was storekeeper school and it was right there in Palm Beach. So then I graduated from storekeeper.
storekeeper school. Uh, now, now, what was that like, the storekeeper school? What did you learn there? Well, uh, learned uh, to, to make out order forms and everything. You know, I mean, this was for Coast Guard, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. You had to do requisitions and yeah, order. Yeah, all that stuff, you know. And, uh, and of course, I, I already had typing and shorthand, but that was more in, in the yeoman line. So I really didn't have to use my shorthand, but I did use the typing. Mm -hmm. You know, I did use the typing, so that was good. And, uh, yeah, so then after storekeeper school, permanent duty station, Boston, Massachusetts. So at Constitution Wharf, it's still a Coast Guard station. And whenever I go to Boston, I go past it for old time's sake, and it's still a Coast Guard station. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, so that was my active duty, you know. Now, what was life like for you in Boston? What, oh. what was your work routine like? Yeah, okay. Well, it was, uh, we were billeted in Brookline at 1501 Beacon Street, Brookline. It used to be a, an apartment building that they took over for, you know, Coast Guard, for the SPARS uh, building. And uh, so, you know, you had curfew. You had to be in every night, 9 o'clock. I would be in bed every night, 9. And funny part of it is another girl from Cohoes <laughs> was on, on the desk there in the Coast Guard. Yeah. Now you knew her before you went. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. Hey, and I didn't even tell you when I was on KP duty, down in, in, see every three weeks there was a new recruit team coming in, a new set of recruits, and so I went in. I was there three weeks, so I was on KP dishing out the grub down the chai line, and who comes? To, I go to, and I look and I oh, it's Monique, Monique, <laughs> Monique, Monica to you. Monique Amiat. Her father was my dentist. I still got some old fillings he put in here, you know, like 70 years ago. Well, anyhow, so she was just three weeks behind me in Florida. So, and then, just coincidence, she also got stationed in Boston. Hmm. And so, uh, yeah, so I used to see her every day. When I'd come in and check in at night, she was at the desk there making sure I got in. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so then in, in, the, in the morning, you know, you'd have Reveille, you'd get up out of bed, and uh, you'd get dressed, and we would go outside and, and take the tea, the Boston tea. That's the transportation. And uh, it was, you know, then I'd get off at Haymarket Square and walk the whole length of Hanover Street, which was very, very Italian, you know. It's like Little Italy there, Hanover Street, all the way down. Constitution Wharf, I would climb up the stairs to the second floor. That was the supply office, and that's where I worked. I had a desk, I had a typewriter, I would get requisition forms from from uh, the Coast Guard cutters or, or the lighthouses or whoever wanted something, and I would type them up, and uh, and so, it, so we were, you know, there were quite a few spars that worked there in that, in that office, and uh, that was for the first naval district there. And, um, but there were also some civilian girls. Most of them were Irish girls from South Boston. So I got to know some Irish girls from South Boston. And after the war was over and I was home, I got an invitation to a couple of their weddings and I did go back to Boston to attend their weddings in South Boston. Now, did, did you work with men also, or was it strictly women? Well, in the it, it was all women in that office at the desks. Uh -huh. But we had a male officer, you know, the office, the, the head guy there for the supply office was a, a male off, you know. Mm -hmm. So. Now, were there enlisted men working there also, or? Well, it, it, it was really, you know, I would just go to the second floor because that was my supply office. Mm -hmm. But the pay office was on the first floor, okay? So, hey, there were a few movie stars who were in the Coast Guard. Really? And so when it was payday, 
when the shift came in and, and we knew, hey, we would look for some excuse to have to get down to the first floor. Uh -huh. I, I saw a few of them. Oh, yeah, there are a few. I don't want to mention any names. <laughs> Cesar Romero was one of them. <laughs> oh. Anyhow, that, that was a little, you know, extra that uh, <laughs> I, I hadn't, didn't think that would happen, but hey, it was fun. Now, did you get to see any USO shows at all? No, I didn't see any USO shows, but I, I did get down to the USO, down on the watering place of the cows. That's how Boston streets were done, you know, they paved behind the cows, and uh, so it was right down in, in the... Um, of course, there's the public gardens here, and then there's the Boston Commons, and that was where the watering hole for the cows were. When you know, and they paved behind the cow paths, and that's how, that's why the streets in Boston are all kind of wavy and curly and kind of funny, and very narrow. But anyhow, they they put up a temporary building there that was the USO. Hey, and so. I used to go down and jitterbug at night. And hey, that's how you got your exercise in those days. <laughs> Nothing like jitterbugging. Oh, dear. I mean, today everybody gets gymnasiums in their garage or in their basement. They're, you know, and mm -hmm. Or they go to a gym, you know. I'll tell you, the jitterbugging is what kept me in shape. <laughs> and then walking. I, I used to walk all over in Boston. Walk all over. I never just used to walk. Love to walk. Now, could you wear civilian clothes, or did no. you always have to wear a no, uniform? No, this during the war when there's a war on, and I imagine it's the same today. I'm not sure, but back then, World War II, every person who was in the military, whether it was the Army, the Navy, the Coast Guard, or whatever, Marine Corps, had to be in in full uniform. In the only t you know, whether they were just out in leisure or going to work or whatever, you had to be in full uniform. And except when you were in your own barracks, I suppose you could run around in your your t-shirt. But I didn't even have any civilian clothes with me because there was no need for it. Okay. So I I left all my clothes in my closet back home. Well, anyhow. While I was in the service, stationed in Boston, my mother and father bought another house up on the hill in Cohoes. And so the house where I was born and grew up, they moved out of there and they were renting it out. So she had to empty out all the closets. She got rid of all my clothes, everything. <laughs> so I didn't even have any civilian clothes to come home to. She had cleaned everything out. When moving day came, you know, before moving day, I had cousins live next door, and she gave it all to them, you know, because they were, we were all thin then. Mm -hmm. Nobody was obese then like they are today. Oh, my God, all this couch potatoes? No. Anyhow, yeah, so my, all my civvies were gone. And, I mean, you didn't know how long the, the war would last. And when, when you signed up, and there's a war one, when you volunteered, you volunteered for the duration of the war. And, you know, nobody knew how long the war would last. It could have lasted 10, 20 years. Who knows? So, anyhow, you know, we thank God it didn't last too long. What was it like when the war did end? Was, ah, was there a lot of celebration? Oh, my God. Boston. Oh, you, you know, the, the newspaper photo pic People really took pictures all over the place. You know, New York City, Boston, all the big cities. Oh my, I mean, people were celebrating in the streets and you know, hallelujah. Yeah, so anyhow, yeah, so that's how it was. Do you remember uh, where you were and how you felt? You said that President Roosevelt was the only president you remembered. Oh yeah. Well, how did you feel when he died? Oh. God, you know, I know it. He, 
he, he was such a good president. Hey, and you know, we didn't we didn't even know about his infirmities that he had had, you know, polio and and uh, you know and and then when he died, I mean I said, Oh my god, you know and and with, you know, Winston Churchill and I mean, oh God, they all these get togethers they had and everything and, and you know, and finally the Axis, the Nazis, you know, and then, and then when it all came out about Auschwitz and all those terrible, terrible places that went on, it, you know, it, ah, I mean, all this stuff is terrible when you think of it, you know, and we hope there'll never be anything like that again. And of course, I had uncles, and my friend, you know, they all went off, off to World War One. And it wasn't even called World War I because they never thought there would be a World War II. It was just called the Great War. The Great War. The war to end all wars. Oh, and I mean, they went over the hill and in the trenches and everything in France. And it's, it's like a miracle that they returned. That they returned. And so, you know, my Uncle Lachelle and my Uncle Paul, they, and their children, they all grew up right next to me. We all lived, you know, everybody had a house here do, do, on Lancaster Street in Cohoes. We all had, you know, my grandfather, Pip here, had a brickyard and he built a brick house for my father, the oldest one, and then for Uncle Lachelle, and then Uncle Paul, you know, all on the same street. And then a big garage, that big garage and I was, they made, I don't know, six or eight apartments out of it now, you know, yeah. So it, it's, you know, but anyhow, when when World War II was declared and, you know, I mean, that's when they called the Great War, got renamed World War I. So that's how it went, you know. Was there any person or persons that you remember that left an impression on you or were close friends while you were in the service? Oh, God, yes. I, I made such good friends. You know, two Italian girls from Brooklyn, they were great friends. And I went down to their wedding and they came up, they came to my house in Cajos for their honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gave them my bedroom for their honeymoon. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's not like honeymoons today. Ah. Uh, and then they came up to my wedding, and and then and they drove up. They had a car. Now me and my new husband, we didn't have a car. We were married in in 1948, and we didn't have a car. Hey, and so they came up. They drove up from Brooklyn, and believe it or not. We went to New York City, we got in the car with them and got a free ride down in New York for our honeymoon. <laughs> so we were two days in a hotel in New York City. <laughs> that was, you know, uh -huh. hey, after the war. Oh, it was hard to find a place to live, it was hard to find furniture. You know, that's after the war, that's post-war era, yeah. And, you know, like in Troy, they, they built temporary housing for returning veterans you know, all over the place. Temporary housing went up in Troy. I, oh, yeah. Do you ever I, think, did you ever uh, perform any unusual duties or services while you were well, there? Well, believe it or not, when I was in Boston in the supply office, if they needed a supply that could have been purchased right there, right there on Atlantic Avenue in Boston, hey, I, I was the one that would always volunteer to go fetch it. <laughs> that was part of my walking, and I would be out the door, and, and I would go. I mean, it's not like Boston today. I mean, this was Atlantic Avenue with all the, you know, the old wharfs and everything, rat infested, and, and then all these little, you know, uh, marine stores, one after the other, all along Atlantic Avenue. So... If there was something that could be picked up and brought in, you know, to hasten, <laughs> hey, I, I would always volunteer to go. I love to walk. Ah, I used to run all over. How were you treated by the civilian population? 
Well, very good. You know, like I said, we have some civilian girls <laughs> working in our office that I became very friendly with. And like I, I said, when the war was over, I went back to Boston to attend their weddings in South, South Boston, you know? And so we became good friends. And then I became good friends with girls that I worked with, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and girls that I was in boot camp with, I'll never forget, you know? Oh, yeah. So have you stayed in contact with oh, a lot yeah. of them over the years? Edith Isinger from the Bronx, you know, I went to her house in the Bronx and had a, you know, a beautiful Jewish meal. Her mother cooked me gefilte fish I'd never uh -huh. had, you know? Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, and her her grandfather was at the table with the skull cap on and, and uh, you know, and presided at the table, you know. Oh, yeah, so, and then in... in in Brooklyn, I went to, with my Italian girlfriends, you know, like I said, Millie, Millie Bonarigo, you know, oh yeah, and, you know, and like I say, she came to my house for her honeymoon, brought her husband, Tiny, <laughs> Tiny, Capella, <laughs> I still remember all the names, and then I went to reunions. I went to a couple of reunions, you know, Washington, D.C., at that big hotel there. Oh, the biggest hotel. What's the name of it? I can't. Oh, but it was great, you know. And so this was a spa reunion mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. And then I went to another spa reunion at the Commodore Hotel in New York City. And at that one, I brought my husband with me. I mean, he had been discharged from the... A, a Marine Corps, and he was also in the Marine Corps Reserves, and he almost went to Korean War <laughs> in 1950. Oh, he had to go down to Albany. We were married two years. We were married in 1948, and then in 1950, you know, the Korean War was on. Here's another war. And he was in the Marine Corps Reserves. Hey, they were calling out the reserves for that yeah. war. He was in it. Uh, so he got his papers, took it down to Albany for his physical. And the same day that, I mean, I labored all day Labor Day. And this was the next day on the Tuesday. And my daughter was born that morning at 7.30 at the old Leonard Hospital in North Troy. They used to call it Lansingburg. Well, anyhow, and he had to be down to Albany for his physical at 8 o'clock. So here, he comes up. Oh, Antoinette, we have a beautiful daughter. We'll name her Stella after my mother. I have to be in Albany by 8 o'clock for my physical for the Marine Corps Reserves. I'll see you as soon as I get out of there and I'll come back. Off he went. That, that was it. Off he went. Albany. It took him all day, all day, believe it or not, to get rejected on his physical because he had had a, a knee operation in the spring. Now, when he had that knee operation for a split cartilage, Oh, I thought it was terrible. Here I am pregnant for our first child, and I didn't know how to drive. We didn't even have a car. And I used to go visit him every day at the Samaritan Hospital. You know, in those days, they kept you in like two, three weeks for Pete's sakes. You know, it's not like today. Soon, mm -hmm. soon. Most everything is not even in the hospital. It's out, out, out in the doctor's office or something. Well, anyhow... But it, it turned out to be a blessing in disguise, as far as I was concerned, because that knee operation was the only thing that rejected him on the, on the physical to go away to the Korean War. Now there's another war, you know? And now we're, you know, the Vietnam War and the Gulf War and all my, you know? Ah, I don't know if the wars will ever end. When, when is mankind going to learn that nobody wins a war? Mm -hmm. We're all losers. It's terrible. Oh, God. How I pray. How do you think your time in the...
Coast Guard changed or had an effect on your life? Well, I, I certainly learn to get along so well with so many different ethnic groups and I had to learn my prayers in English. I didn't even know them in English. When I went to confession down in Florida at the Catholic Church there and I told the priest, I said, you know, I don't know my act of contrition in English. He said, well, that's all right. Just say it in whatever language you learned it in. So I said my act of contrition in French. And I got absolution. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I did get to uh, learn about so many wonderful people, you know, and I, of course, just the traveling, you know, I mean, Palm Beach, uh, when I go back to Palm Beach, and I do go back just to look it over, you know, and I, I go look at, at the old SS Biltmore, that's what we called it, you know, the spar training ship Biltmore. Well, they've made apartments out of it, and it's high class. Oh, my God. You know, yeah, so it's still there. And the Sun and Surf Club, where we used to go swimming, I mean, it, you know, I mean, Palm Beach is Palm Beach. It's, it's high class living down there, I'll tell you. And uh, and then Boston. Well, out of my ten children, one of my daughters is there in Boston, so I go quite often to visit her. And I and I tell, and she has seven sons now. She married one of those nice Italian boys that used to live on Hanover Street. You know where I used to walk down every morning on my way to Constitution Wharf. And I'm sure he must have been in a baby carriage, and I must have rubbed his head and marked him for my daughter Maria. <laughs> and so she married him. She went, she went to Boston to study architecture. Well, when she met Paul Fredora, the architecture went out the window. She got married, and they raised seven boys. She has restaurants in Troy, in Troy, in Boston, and the Daily Catch. There's a free commercial. And, and she lives in... Uh, in across the River Charles. I got to call it the River Charles. Not plain old Charles River, it's the River Charles. And uh, and I used to see the boys from Harvard and their shells, you know, canoeing down and all that stuff. And it was very nice. I got to see how the, you know, and so where my mother, or my, my daughter Maria lives, and she lives in, um, in Cambridge, across the River Charles in Cambridge, right between MIT and Harvard. And so when I go visit her, I take in all the museums all over the place. There's museums galore in Boston. And believe it or not, during the war, they were all locked up and mothballed, just like the old SS Constitution, old Ironsides. It was, it was right there, pulled in a Constitution Wharf. And I used to see it every day before I go up to the second floor to the supply office. It was there, and I could never go into it because it was, everything was mothballed during the war. That's how it was during the war. Everything was locked up. So, okay, now we're in a different kind of war. Okay, could you show us the uh, bombing? Could you tell us when and where that oh, was taken? Yeah. If this, you hold it this, up. This was taken uh, in, in Boston. See, I've got my chevrons here. I'm a storekeeper first, third class here. I'm a third third class storekeeper. And, and believe it or not, I took all the correspondence courses and I did get to storekeeper second class. And so that took in, you know, storekeepers, the cross keys, and not to be confused with the crossed quills, which is the yeoman, and, uh, and second class, you get two chevrons, and anyhow, I took another <coughs> correspondence course, and 
course, then the war was over, so I never even bothered to sew on my third chevron. <laughs> okay, thank you. Now you had some others where you were, they were taken at the uh, Coast Guard Academy? That oh, yes. You want yes. to hold those I, up? Oh, I'd never been to the Coast Guard Academy because, you know, I, I was never an officer. But anyhow, my daughter Cecilia, who's my second oldest daughter, she took me there and we went down. And so here's, here's pictures from, there's the poster that got me in the Coast Guard. And there's me. 80 years old, seeing in the museum at the Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut. And it was beautiful. If you get a chance, go on down to New London and you can visit the museum. It's beautiful, lovely. And it did bring back all kind of memories for me. Yes. And uh, so the Coast Guard Spars, and that Spars, S-P-A-R, of course, it's a nautical term, if you know anything about mm -hmm. a ship, but it stands for Semper Paratus, always ready. If you know Latin, Semper okay. Paratus is Latin, like Semper Fidelis is for the Marine Corps. That was my husband's outfit. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, too bad we still have wars. That's how yes. I feel. And anyhow, my husband passed away, and... So, here, here's where he's buried, up at Saratoga, and that's my spot right next to him. And it's there waiting for me. I thought, sure, I would go before him, but I'm still hanging around. He's gone two years already. He died the day after Valentine's Day, two years ago. So, we never know when we're going to go, so when you got to go, there's my spot. Okay. Ready and waiting for me. Okay. See, this is my jacket I put over him. Keep his tombstone warm. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very thank much you. for the interview.